It's now time for oral questions. The leader of the Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development. I think I'll ask to stand down the lead question until the Minister arrives. Agreed? Agreed. Am I right? I do have to seek a agreement. The, the leader of the royal opposition has requested to stand on his lead. I move to the leader of the third party. Reset the clock. Speaker, my question is for the uh, acting premier. The Liberals don't seem to believe that people aren't uh, getting their money. The minister says she's finding it difficult to validate these anecdotes. Speaker, well, here's a validation for her. Leanne Ch uh, Chard's son uh, has a disability, and he relies on ODSP to pay his bills. And when his check didn't arrive, Leanne looked into the issue. She was told her son was removed from the system, and Leanne, as her son's trustee, was also removed from the system speaker. Leanne called the Liberal constituency office of her MPP and was given the cold shoulder. So will the Liberals admit that these problems are real and actually start fixing them? Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, and uh, as I think everyone in this House knows, we are doing the very important work of replacing an old, outdated system that did not serve clients well, nor was it uh, the best system for the workers. So, as we're moving into this, uh, we're in this transition period. I want to say thank you to those frontline workers who are working very, very hard to fix any problems as they arise. I also want people to know, people who are uh, uh, in recipient, uh, recipients of social assistance, to know that we are absolutely committed to make sure they get the checks that they are, in, in fact, entitled to. I do want to uh, comment, Speaker. Uh, additional staff have been sent to local offices. People are working around the clock to fix any problems, uh, and we've had uh, great success, in fact, Within 24 hours, 99 percent of the overpayments were stopped or retracted. So, Speaker, this is a system that's worked in Australia, in the UK, New Zealand, Germany, and New York City. I know the minister will want to address any supplementary Thank you. questions. Supplementary. Speaker, Leanne's son's next check is actually due on the 22nd of December, and she's worried that if there's another round of problems, there will be nobody for her to call over the holidays. Can the Liberals guarantee? that this problem is solved and that there won't be any late checks in December? Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister of Community and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to reassure all members of this House that we take our jobs in the Ministry of Community and Social Services extremely seriously. Uh, the welfare of vulnerable people is our number one concern. Uh, I have been asking searching questions of my officials. I've been calling mayors. I want to hear about those vulnerable people who have unfortunately not received the appropriate payment that, to which they are entitled. And it is this type of uh, hands-on approach that I'm personally taking to this issue. Uh, and uh, I want to hear everything that I need to hear in order to ensure that the December Answer. checks is in fact uh, successful. Here, Thank here, you, here, Mr. Here. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Yes, the minister, minister should tell her MPPs that she wants to hear the stories because Leanne went to her MPP, a Liberal MPP, and was given the cold shoulder when her story was shared. So the minister needs to actually tell her MPPs to do their job. Leanne is worried that her problem won't be solved, Speaker, and frankly, I am worried too. Since this program la uh, launched, we're told that nearly 10,000 separate incident reports have been created, and hundreds more are being created by the day. Incident reports because there have, have been problems with the checks. Now that says to me that the problem still has not been fixed, Speaker. Now can the Liberals give any guarantees whatsoever to the thousands of people of vulnerable Ontarians, Ontarians who rely 
rely on ODSP and rely on social assistance, that their next checks are actually going to be in the mail and going to be delivered on time. Question. <laughs> Minister. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do want to reassure the member of the third, the leader of the third party, that we have put in a very strong support strategy for our frontline workers uh, to troubleshoot issues that uh, may be arising uh, from the new system. And so, since the SAMS launch, my ministry has also put in place uh, dedicated phone lines and email addresses for areas that are particularly challenging for staff, so they have direct access to support staff. There's some 42 additional staff in the field. Uh, any uh, uh, area office that is having specific differences, uh, we will send committed individuals to that office. Um, so anybody uh, in terms of uh, our municipal partners, ODSP officers requesting that kind of additional support, they're going to be getting that. Uh, and we are, of course, in daily contact with all our partners. I'm getting reports uh, on an ongoing uh, basis Answer. in terms of the issues locally. And again, we urge any person who has uh, an issue with their payment uh, to contact their caseworker, and uh, we will make Thank every you. effort to rectify the problem. New question. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Acting Premier. Yesterday, we asked for the contract that the Liberals signed with IBM for the deeply flawed SAMS program, but we didn't get it, Speaker. So I'm going to try again. Will the Liberals release the contract with IBM that left people across Ontario without the social assistance and ODSP that they rely on? The Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, uh, clearly hearing uh, uh, the comments made yesterday, uh, I think we're all aware that there is a process in terms of document oh, release. Uh, I have looked into this, and uh, of course, we wish to be open and transparent. Uh, and so. We are going to be following the type of process that is required in this uh, type of uh, contractual relationship between a private uh, company and the government. Uh, there may be some proprietary, commercially sensitive information in the contract. Uh, uh, the, the process will be followed if there is a formal document re uh, uh, request, uh, Sir? and I certainly won't interfere with that process. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. The government confirmed that Ontario is getting private sector IT support for the massive problems with this SAMS program. When there's a problem with the software, Speaker, Ontarians deserve to know who's actually paying to fix it. Either IBM has to fix the problem, or we're paying out of pocket to fix their faulty product. Will the Liberals release the contract so we can see which one, one of these it is? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I have been informed that uh, the issue of transition uh, was addressed in the contract and uh, that our private uh, sector uh, partners are covering all the costs of the transition support that is required for the front line uh, through uh, the requirements of the contract. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. The Liberals were warned that this computer system was not ready and would likely have massive problems, Speaker. In fact, the people that warned them are right here in this House with us today. They ignored the advice, and now vulnerable Ontarians are the ones that are having to pay the price. Ontarians have the right to know who is paying for that decision, Speaker. Will the Deputy Premier, the minister responsible for transparency, live up to that mandate and actually release the contract? Minister. Um, well, Mr. Speaker, I, I can simply repeat what I've said before. There's a process in terms of release of this type of information. I will not interfere in any way with that process. I will encourage that process to take place. Uh, but clearly, <laughs> this type of uh, information may contain some commercially sensitive information, and uh, I think everyone needs to respect that. And I want to just make it very clear that our, our job one in our ministry is to ensure that all vulnerable people are appropriately taken care of. Up the clock. I'm trying my best to listen to the answer, but with the interruption on my left, it's a little difficult. 
You're not going to learn much from the answer. The member for Renfrew, Nipperson, and Pembroke, I don't need your comments. Minister? Um, I simply would like to reassure everyone, yet again, that our job is to ensure that uh, checks are delivered smoothly. Every effort is being taken to ensure that the next check run will go well. Uh, people are working constantly Answer. in this regard. We have the support of our private sector partners, IBM, in this endeavour. and. Uh, we uh, want to assure everyone Thank that we are following due process. Thank you. The Leader of the, Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Uh, Minister, Ontario's auto sector is the backbone of communities throughout our province. We all know the hard work and tremendous pride auto workers put into their jobs. That's why it's so alarming to hear union and auto industry executives raise concerns about the troubled state of General Motors' Canadian operations. Next year, for example, example, Chevrolet Camaro production stops in Oshawa altogether and will move to Lansing, Michigan. In 2016, just a year and a half from now, one of the two assembly plants in Oshawa is scheduled to close. A shutdown of Oshawa would result in nearly 3,600 jobs lost. Minister, what action is your government taking to stop the shutdown of auto production yeah. in Oshawa, Ontario? Good question. Minister of Economic Development. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me let me let me tell you uh, right off the bat what we're not going to do. Stop the clock. The members closest to me on my left. It's very difficult for me to carry on if you keep trying to shout the person who's answering. Next time you'll be named. The minister. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you right off the bat what we're not going to do. We're not going to do what the PC party did at, at, the, at, the, at the earliest sign of trouble in the auto sector during the recession. They ran and hid, Mr. Speaker. They failed to stand up for the auto sector. We partnered with the federal government, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that GM is even here today. Because had we not have done that, Mr. Speaker, had we had taken the advice of the party opposite, we would not have an auto sector like we have today here in the province of Ontario. An auto sector, Mr. Speaker, that employs over 400,000 Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, the member raises some, some valid concerns. We Thanks, are looking sir. carefully at the future of GM in Oshawa, and Mr. Speaker, but in, in my supplementary, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the optimism of the new president of GM with regard to his invent their investments Thank you. in Ontario. Supplementary. Minister, Minister, these aren't meant to be hard-hitting partisan questions. This is meant to stand up for the hard-working yeah. men and women in our auto yeah. Other jurisdictions, as you know, are taking urgent action to strengthen their auto sectors for the 21st century marketplace. In 2013, Michigan's governor created the Michigan Automotive Office. This office is headed by an experienced industry professional who reports directly to the governor. That's how serious Michigan takes its auto industry. So it's not surprising that Oshawa's Chevrolet Camaro is moving to Lansing, Michigan. The Michigan Automotive Office has issued a 30-year strategic plan to grow the state's automotive industry base. And Minister, I just ask you, where is your long-term plan to grow Ontario's automotive base? Sure, yeah. Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let me talk about the investments this government has, has made over the objections of the party opposite to grow our economic base in the auto sector. Mr. Speaker, $800 million of investment we've invested in the last 10 years. We've gotten back $10 billion of investment made by auto companies here in the province of Ontario for investments, Mr. Speaker, that the party opposite refers to as corporate welfare. Shame on you, Mr. Speaker. Shame on the party opposite to get up today, a party that does not support any support that we've given to the auto sector, any support that we've given to the hardworking men and women, 400,000 strong that have jobs in this sector. Mr. Speaker, they've opposed us every step of the way. We'll continue to work with the auto sector in this province. We'll continue to work with our companies. We'll continue to make those important investments, and we'll continue to have a strong auto sector here in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, the minister can be partisan and get in a bickering match with, with us, I suppose. Uh, it's not going to help the workers who are depending on his government to do the right thing. Obviously, what you're doing isn't working, Minister. GM's leaving. The plan is on the table. The warning signs are there. So what you're doing isn't, isn't working. In Michigan, they don't just don't throw billions of dollars after billions of dollars. They have a seven-point plan that doesn't involve money. It involves marketing, strategic branding, talent development, and attracting new ta talent. Engineering network, policy and legislative advice to the government, business development advice, working collaboratively with the government, capital attraction and development. These are things that don't cost billions of dollars. You raise electricity rates, slap on the red tape, put up the taxes, here, here. and then throw billions of dollars to correct right. your mistakes. You're drive the van to Mexico. It's not working. When are you going to come up with a 30-year plan that works? Yeah. Down, please. Minister. Why the party opposite so admires the administration in Michigan? They're a right-to-work state, Mr. Speaker. That's why they like the state of Michigan. And you know what else, Mr. Speaker? They have an $8 minimum wage in Michigan. I know that party would love to bring our minimum wage down to $8, but get this, Mr. Speaker. They also don't have a lack of support for maternity leave in Michigan. That's the kind of administration they want to run. That's not the kind of province we're building here in this province of Ontario. We support our auto workers, Mr. Speaker, and we support our auto workers. Minister, we continue to work in partnership with that sector. We're going to continue to make investments like we made near his riding in Alliston. $857 million investment by Honda just a few weeks ago. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue. Stop the clock. It doesn't seem um, as I'm getting true to some of you. On the government side, the Minister of Environment, you're the loudest. I'd ask you to keep it down. <laughs> Go back to the <laughs> New question. The member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, your government has continuously promised to fix the troubled CCACs. We've heard repeatedly of the bloated CCAC CEO executive salaries, which cost us $3.5 million every year. All the while, there are cuts to home care services that are leaving our frail, elderly people and people with disabilities in peril. The situation is truly appalling. Minister, can you tell this House how you're going to get these 14 CEO salaries under control so that money can be put back into frontline care? Minister of Health. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, um, in fact, uh, over the last number of years, we have been reducing the CCAC CEO salaries uh, considerably. In fact, they, in 2007, they amounted to 5.6 million total, and in fact, in 2012, they were down to 3.6 million dollars. And uh, it's not just the CEO salaries as well. The proportion of the total CCAC expenses that go to administrative costs have also declined significantly and are estimated at 4.4 per cent uh, in 2012-2013. So they are coming down. But, Mr. Speaker, we also have an important bill before the Legislature, yeah. Bill 8, which looks specifically and directly at the issue of executive compensation in the broader public sector. It's going to actually pertain to our CCACs as well and the and salaries sir? of the CEOs and the senior staff there, and it's going to prescribe the parameters uh, for going forward in terms of the level of compensation that's responsible. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Minister of Health. Minister, your ministry stated to the Ottawa Sun, and I quote, that it does not have access to the terms and conditions of the CCAC CEO compensation plans. This is a poor excuse. In fact, your excuse sounds an awful lot like the excuse that Dep the Deputy Premier used to give about Chris Maz's blockbuster salary at Orange, and we all know how that ended. Minister, once again, your Liberal government, patients in frontline care is suffering because you refuse to take action. Why are you abdicating your oversight responsibilities and allowing these salaries to com compromise frontline care? Minister of Health. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm taking my responsibility as Minister of Health very, very seriously. And I appeal to the opposition. I suspect that I may have the support, we may have the support of the member opposite to, to support 
and pass Bill 8, because that bill does precisely what the member opposite is asking for. It allows us to get access to that information and to prescribe within certain parameters, Mr. Speaker, what that executive compensation level should be, not just in our CCACs, but across the broader public sector. So I look forward to the support of the member opposite, and uh, it's an important bill. We've been debating it here in the legislature. The sooner we get it passed, Mr. Speaker, is the sooner we're going to be able to move further in the direction where we all agree we need to, to control the executive uh, compensation. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the Minister of Health. Minister, it's appalling that you would deflect your ministerial responsibility and not take immediate action to get these CEO salaries under control. If it's true that your ministry does not have access to the terms and conditions of these salaries, then why haven't you taken action and tabled legislation in this House to fix it? You used time allocation for lots of other things. Why haven't you used time allocation for this one, Minister? You have had weeks and numerous opportunities to do so, yet you continue to allow frontline care to suffer. Minister, when are you actually going to take action to fix this problem? Minister of Health. I won't. Do that. Well, Mr. Speaker, in fact, we have tabled legislation. <laughs> precisely to do what the member is asking for. It's called we, Bill 8, it's and it's, Bill 8. it's important. It's in, it, it, and and it's reference to time allocation as well. We did, Mr. You Speaker. The so there's no answer. excuse. We have the opportunity in this legislature in a very short period of time to pass this important legislation that will do what the member is asking, is, is provide those parameters and the direction and the ability for every ministry in this government to uh, oversee, be accountable for, provide direction to, create the parameters for and control the executive compensation in the broader pu public sector. Mr. Speaker, I find it unbelievable that the member opposite didn't know that that legislation already exists. Yeah. Thank you. New question, the member for Renfrew and the same member. Much, My uh, question is for the acting premier. Premier, you go your government used the dictatorial power of the majority to shut down the Justice Committee with respect to the uh, inquiry into the gas plant fiasco, be, uh, denying us the opportunity to interview such key witnesses as Laura Miller and Peter Feist. But there's another matter. There's another matter. Going into the election, there was an ongoing OPP criminal investigation into the deletion and destruction of documents within the office of the Premier of Ontario. Yep. Now, Acting Premier, can you give us an update? Because since the election, we've heard nothing. Can you give us an update, or have you asked the OCP for an update onto that investigation into criminal activity in the Premier's office? Thank you, Deputy Premier. The government House Leader. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. I thank the member from Renfrew, Nipissing uh, Pembroke, who was uh, up for posing the question, Speaker. And I want to thank the members of the Justice Committee who have been working very hard in in, uh, in completing the work uh, of the Justice Committee, as was uh, as was committed uh, uh, by this government. Um, I'm, I'm I'm confident that the Justice members of the Justice Committee will continue uh, to do the work and make sure that there is a report available uh, based on all the testimonies and evidence that they they have heard. Uh, speaker, over the last uh, almost three years, uh, be able to give recommendations uh, to the government when it comes to the siting uh, of large uh, energy infrastructure projects, and we look forward uh, uh, to the committee for finishing their work. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. No. Well, Unreal. Acting Premier, the people of Ontario want to know where this investigation is going. If you're not, you haven't asked the OPP for an update. Well, I have. I've written a letter to Detective Constable Duval asking him for an update. And it's, see, look, I'd be the last one to ever accuse this government of doing something underhanded. <laughs> but it might be a little more than coincidental that since you have got your majority, this OPP investigation has gone completely underground. We're not hearing anything about the criminal investigation into the destruction and and deletion of emails within the office of the Premier of Ontario. So I'm asking you today, will you endeavour to get an update from the OPP where this criminal investigation is going? Question. Because the people of Ontario want an answer.
If everyone would notice, I am standing and you're still carrying on. Government House Leader. Uh, I, I, Speaker, I, I think it, I, it would be pretty polite and, uh, and mild for me to say that the question is fairly absurd. Uh, from the member opposite. I think he recognizes that there is a live police investigation that is uh, undergoing, and it will be highly in inappropriate uh, for any member of this House, uh, especially members from the government, to be speaking about that police investigation. The member is a smart individual. He knows, he knows that very clearly, and I think the question is highly inappropriate, uh, and, nor we will start engaging into the discussion around police investigations because that is up to the OPP. They're arm's length and independent from the government, and we will let them finish their work. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member for Bamali Gore-Malta. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. There's a growing trend for charitable organizations to give out gift cards to clients to help them buy gifts for Christmas and groceries for the holidays. Now, Giving gift cards is a more dignified approach to helping these vulnerable people so they don't have to line up at food banks or at Christmas hamper programs. But there is a Grinch out there trying to steal Christmas. Money Mart has piloted an initiative in Hamilton whereby they will redeem these gift cards for cash, but only at 50% of the card's value. Why does this government allow Grinches like Money Mart to steal Christmas from almost vulnerable, vulnerable people in Ontario. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Government Services. Minister of Government Services. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Speaker, and appreciate the uh, question from the member opposite. Uh, as the member knows, there are a number of uh, organizations in Ontario that have been regulated uh, by our government. We've stepped up to enforce and increase uh, regulations with these organizations. It is an ongoing uh, challenge to ensure that the practices that are uh, unscrupulous, like you're talking about, uh, are that we ensure that uh, these individuals are put out of business or that there are greater regulations. We've increased protections under the Consumer uh, Protection Act. Uh, we've increased the fines as well for organizations and individuals individuals who uh, may conduct business like this. Uh, as you uh, are aware, there was one of these organizations that our ministry did take a very uh, significant action to ensure uh, that they were put out of business uh, because of the practices that they were that they were. Answer. So we are going to continue to be vigilant with respect to these organizations, and we will continue to bring forward legislation and change regulations where necessary to ensure that these practices uh, are, uh, are are dealt with. I'd also uh, indicate Thank that you. Member, our government has uh, eliminated. The expiry Thank you. Paid gift cards. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This is just one of the many areas that we've seen uh, time and time again that payday, the Payday Loan Act needs to be tightened up, forcing individuals who are already under a great deal of stress during the holidays to pay this extraordinarily high rate for an exchange is simply disgusting. I think everyone in this House agrees that these, this type of scheme that takes advantage of people that are already so vulnerable and particularly at this given time of year, is not acceptable. Is the minister's heart two sizes too small that he won't ban this exorbitantly high exchange and allow paydays to take advantage of people like this? Will the minister do something to address this problem so that it doesn't happen? Shut it down. Minister of Government yeah, Services. Absolutely. I think we all agree, and this is certainly not a partisan issue, that those individuals who are vulnerable and those individuals that from time to time may need to use these organizations uh, to uh, complete financial transactions, we want to ensure that uh, they're not taken advantage of. We have a cap on the uh, maximum allow allowable uh, borrowing rates uh, in Ontario, and uh, they are uh, in, a, in about the middle of the range across the country, as the uh, member knows full well. We've brought in regulations to tighten up uh, payday lending and uh, deal very aggressively, uh, quite frankly, uh, with an organization in this province that uh, was uh, practicing beyond their scope of their license, in other words, uh, taking advantage, quite frankly, of vulnerable uh, residents in the province of Ontario. So uh, we will be responding to this, and uh, if the member has any uh, specific information, I'd be happy to uh, speak to him about that uh, as we as continue continuing to uh, enforce these regulations. Thank you. 
The member for Burlington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Give him help. Minister, on Tuesday, you announced that there will be amendments made to Ontario securities laws with the goal of promoting greater representation of women on the boards of publicly traded companies. My constituents in the riding of Burlington, and indeed I'm certain all Ontarians, are very pleased with this announcement. Studies have shown that greater gender diversity on corporate boards will promote stronger organizational health, improved innovation, leadership growth, and performance. Having been fortunate enough to hold multiple senior-level positions, including those on publicly traded companies, prior to becoming an MPP, I take pride in this measure our government is implementing. Minister, could you please tell this House why you are taking this important step? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you to the member, the honourable member from Burlington, for a very thoughtful question. You know, uh, Mr. Speaker, women make up 48 per cent of the workforce and yet only account for 16 per cent of board members. Through discussions and surveys conducted by the OSC, we've learned that 50 per cent of respondent companies have no women directors. And moreover, women working at the remaining respondent companies only account for 10 per cent of women on senior levels. Further findings tell us that companies with higher representation of women in executive level positions experience 35 per cent higher return on equity and 34 per cent higher total return to shareholders. I agree with my caucus colleague that greater gender diversity promotes stronger organizational health, innovation, improved leadership, and business performance. And Mr. Speaker, that's why we're calling for this disclosure. Answer. I think most of us in this House agree and recognize the great potential available for all of us by having more women in executive positions, and I'm proud that we're taking these steps. Thank, thank you. you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. Research has indeed found that gender diversity in corporate leadership is linked to improved governance and stronger performance on both financial and non-financial measures. We know that increasing the number of women in corporate leadership is good for the economy and good for business. It's also good for society. And that's why helping women reach their full potential by supporting women in leadership is part of this government's commitment to creating a strong and fair Ontario. The minister responsible for women's issues has noted that this announcement is a critical step towards achieving gender equality across all sectors. Can the minister please tell us how these measures will serve to promote equality and leadership within the corporate world and beyond? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Finance. Minister responsible for women's issues, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. So, as Minister of Finance uh, mentioned, women account for only 16 per cent of members of Canada's FP500 companies, and, Speaker, that hasn't moved for a very, very long time. So, when we tabled the 2013 Ontario budget, it included a commitment to broaden gender diversity in corporate leadership. So last year, when we asked the Ontario Securities Commission to undertake the review and public consultation on this approach, we felt strongly this was a policy that would encourage and support firms to increase the representation of women in corporate leadership. And what is quite remarkable and wonderful, Speaker, is that other Canadian regulators are now following Ontario's lead to comply or explain and are coordinating, uh, coordinating efforts with our Ontario Answer. Securities Commission. So we're very excited about this announcement, Speaker, and the positive change our government's action uh, will take to bring corporate sector uh, Thank representation you. of women, women up higher. Thank you. The member for Lennox, Frontenac, Addy. Lennox, Frontenac. Thank you, Speaker. Oh. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services and Outdated Excuses. Minister, my office has been inundated Order. I, I would say to the member, in this legislature, we have always respected each other and respected their titles. I'd ask you to withdraw. I withdraw. Thank you. Carry on. Minister, my office has been inundated with calls this week after the problems with your new SAMS program were made public. These individuals have told us that the issues with the new software at Ontario Works and ODSP are far greater than your government is letting on. We have obtained information that many frontline staff are taking stress leave, and contrary to the earlier statements in the House, there are taking additional staff. They're taking time off due to their inability to help their clients, and they're frustrated being able not to do their job properly. 
Minister, how many workers at ODSP in Ontario Thank you. have taken stress leave due to your little glitch? Minister of Community and Social <laughs> Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, certainly, I'm delighted to hear that the member opposite is suddenly so concerned yeah. about yeah. frontline workers. Uh, I'm sure that those frontline workers were under considerable distress when your government cut social assistance yeah. rates by some 20 yeah. yeah. percent. We are supporting in every way nice those frontline workers. That was a nice move. We have put in hotlines. So we have supported staff shameful. to help them. The party that asks the question is the loudest. So obviously you don't want the answer. Minister. I think we need to understand this is a new system. At the end of the day, it will make uh, the system overall much, much better. Caseworkers will be able to spend more time with their clients. Uh, we know that they are concerned for their, uh, for their clients. Uh, we're trying to support them in Answer. every way that we possibly can through this uh, uh, introduction of this new system. Absolutely. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, at least the Premier has shown the decency to apologize to those who have been affected by these problems and not resort to deflection in her responses, such as you have just done. It would be nice to see if you would show the same respect and courtesy to those employees. Not only is the new software proven to be very problematic in the delivery of these services, it's stressful that workers are taking time off. But when workers are taking time off due to a broken system, who knows how many other people will be affected by the shortage of frontline caseworkers as a result. Minister, will you demonstrate transparency, accountability, and openness, and a genuine respect for the people of Ontario, and bring yourself and your staff back to the Questions. Questions Committee, and really, let's examine this little glitch in far greater detail instead of just having deflection from this minister. Minister of Community and Social Thank Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And of course, as I've said before, I, I truly apologize to those individuals who've suffered hardship uh, through this new computer system. And uh, I am working constantly uh, in terms of hearing from the front lines what those issues are. My ministry is in constant communication with all 257 offices that have had to introduce this very large system. System. And certainly, uh, as we work towards the next pay run, and being mindful, in fact, that the vast majority, some 500,000 people, did receive their payments on time this last pay run, uh, we want to make that 100% this next pay run. There's no question about it. Uh, we are doing everything we can to Answer. make sure that that happens. We are offering support to frontline workers. Uh, we will be covering overtime costs for those workers, as I've assured many of my my municipal colleagues, Thank you. and uh, we want to get this right. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. The member for London, Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. This Liberal government has promised again and again to fully inspect every long-term care home by the end of this year. On April 15th, the Deputy Premier said, and I quote, I stand by my earlier commitment that every long-term care home in this province will have had the rigorous quality inspection by the end of this calendar year. But now, with just days to go, it's been revealed that 60 per cent of long-term care homes still haven't been inspected. Wow. Why has this Liberal government broken its promise to protect seniors by failing to inspect each and every long-term care home before the end of this year? Wow. Minister of Health. To the Associate Minister of Health. Deputy Minister of Health. Associate. <laughs> should say sorry. Don't talk about Bob Bell. Thank you, Speaker. And I thank the member opposite for that question. It's a very important question. And I want to give reassure this House that indeed, by the end of this month, we would have scheduled every last inspection in the long-term care homes 
all 633, and we look forward. We look forward to completing them very shortly in the new year. Speaker, the main thing, the main thing is the intent. Speaker, if I may say this, the main thing here is we didn't want to just do them for the sake of doing them. We wanted to make sure we got it right. So yes, they will be all done, completed by the middle of January, and they will all be scheduled by the end of this month. Thank, Thank you, Speaker. You. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, scheduling inspections by the end of the year is not the same as originally promised by the Deputy Premier that they said in this province we will have had the rigorous quality inspections by the end of this year. That's promise. Speaker, it's outrageous that this government has dropped the ball and failed to conduct a resident quality inspection in 60 per cent of long-term care homes. That means seniors and their families don't have the protection this government promised. But we know that the Liberals, what they do when they break a promise, they try to change the promise and hope no one notices. So Tuesday, Speaker, and this is apropos that the minister is responding to the supplement, uh, Tuesday of this week, the associate minister backtracked as fast as she could and promised to schedule every inspection by the end of the year. That's a far cry from what the Deputy Premier's assurances that this inspections would be completed this year. And speaking, Question. I understand that there was an FOI, so maybe that's why the backtracking this year. Will the government own up to this broken promise and tell, and tell, and tell the Ontarians that long-term care residents' homes will be inspected Thank you. and assure the families that 60 per cent of homes Thank will you. have been inspected the this year? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I guess the member opposite didn't listen to my answer because if she had if she had listened to my answer, I have, order. If you well, there's a difference between hearing and listening. If you had just understood my answer, then may I just? I just want to say that. By the middle of January, every last inspection will be done. There's a holiday season, and that is the reason. But the spirit, in the spirit, is being uh, is being respected, and every last home will be inspected. The member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. New question: The member for Ajax Pickering. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Citizenship, Immigration and International Trade. Minister, today is International Volunteer Day, our annual opportunity to thank those who have donated their time in an effort to better their communities. Minister, Ontario depends on not-for-profit organizations and their volunteers to deliver vital services and build strong, inclusive communities. In my writing of Ajax Pickering, a large number of constituents rely on volunteer services for after-school programs, religious services, many athletic clubs and organizations, seniors programs, and much more. It is very important to my constituents and all Ontarians that volunteer programs like these are safeguarded. Speaker, could the minister tell us how the government of Ontario is supporting our volunteer initiatives across our province of Ontario? Thank you. The Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member from Ajax Pickering for asking the question. Speaker, International Volunteer Day is a great opportunity to recognize and also to say thank you to the dedicated volunteers that help make Ontario great. Our government supports a number of programs to help encourage and promote volunteerism in Ontario. We know it is equally important to support activities that broaden understanding about volunteering in Ontario. Speaker, this, this is why, as part of the province legacy plan for the Pan Parapan American Games, our ministry will be working with the Ontario Volunteer Centre Network to create a certification program that recognizes yes, skills acquired for a volunteer placement. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for letting us know about absolutely everything, including how our government is encouraging volunteerism in our province. I'm happy to hear that the Pan Am volunteers will receive certification 
for their hard work at the Games. Over 10,000 athletes and officials from 41 countries will be coming to our province next summer, and the eyes of the world will be on Ontario. The volunteers will be the backbone of the Games, instrumental to delivering a successful Games. Volunteering is going to be a great experience. Volunteers will have the opportunity to make friends from around the world, learn new skills, and make a positive impact on their communities. And I'm happy Question. to hear that their hard work will be recognized by an official certification. Speaker. Could the minister please tell the members of this house? Thank you. There are several conversations going on in the House while the questions are being asked. I would ask those members to take it outside. Minister? For the sake of absolutely, absolutely everything, I want to refer to the Minister of Tourism, Culture, Sport, and also the Minister responsible for the Pan and Parapan American Games. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to start by thanking the volunteers that are with us here today. I know when I thank them, they weren't. Mr. Speaker, one of the greatest legacies of these games are, is our volunteers and the, the skills that they'll be able to acquire during the games. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, they'll be able to take those skills and transfer them into other not-for-profit work, volunteerism, and of course, uh, employment. One of the, uh, the best parts about the volunteer training that we're providing is the accessibility training. And we're going to have over 23,000 people greet our spectators, our, our, our sport athletes, visitors, to Thank really you. help every single person Thank of all you. abilities. Thank you all. I just want to remind the gallery, we do love you being here, but you're not allowed to participate in the debate by cheering or clapping. So I ask you to keep order. New question. The you used to be the only one to get it right. But anyways, my question is to the Minister of Rural Affairs. Minister, since being elected, I've continually heard from my rural municipal leaders about the challenges with the unpredictable and declining Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund. This year, my upper and lower tier municipalities will see a 20% cut in their OMPF funding for the upcoming year, money that could go to critical infrastructure projects. Minister, I find it interesting that the government website states the 2015 OMPF funding has been designate, designed to increase targeted support to those municipalities with the most challenging fiscal circumstances. Minister, South Pole in my riding has lost over 50% of their tax base when Ford closed, and as a result, the local councils announced taxes will rise by 45% over the next three years. However, their OMPF funding was also cut 20%. Uh, Minister, how do you define challenging fiscal circumstances, and is it your plan to balance the budget on the backs Question. of rural municipalities? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, this is an interesting question. It's interesting from the perspective of the party who downloaded, who had an exercise called Who Does What, that became the Who Got Done In exercise, the municipalities got done in. That's the history of the party opposite. That's true. Now, let me. Who done it? Now, let me. Now let me continue, Mr. Speaker. Through extensive consultation with ROBA, the Rural Ontario Municipal Association, the Ontario Municipal Association, we've gone to a formula now, $50 million that provides a set amount every year to municipalities right across the province of Ontario. This is something that municipalities ask for. This is something that we deliver for municipalities. It makes sense. It's a good program and addresses critical infrastructure needs for municipalities right across Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, 
You're talking about policies and decisions made over 15 years ago, and since then you've done nothing to correct them. Minister, it's reflected in the election. We are the voice of rural Ontario on this side of the House. You've got to start listening. Minister, your government's mismanaged taxpayers' money for over a decade, and rural municipalities and their residents are paying for it. Under your government, my riding has lost over 6,000 manufacturing jobs and an enormous Order. amount of tax base from municipalities, yet your government continues to cut the OMPF funding. My rural municipalities do not receive any of the gas tax money, but would like access to in order to deal with their enormous infrastructure deficits. Rural municipalities in my riding would like to see a three- to five-year projection of their individual OMPF funding allocations so they can prepare their budgets accordingly. Question. Minister, you're either not standing up for rural Ontario and Cabinet or you're being completely ignored. Which is it? No. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you, back in 2008, the then Minister of Minnesota Affairs and Housing, the wonderful mayor of Ottawa, Jim Watson, wow. negotiated an unprecedented deal for uploading of services wow. right across Ontario. The services that this party downloaded uh, during their time of government effectively crippled municipal finances right across the province of Ontario. I have no respect for them. The member for Mr. Speaker, our government has order. listened to municipalities through the 2015 program. We'll continue to recognize the challenges of northern and rural municipalities, better target those with challenging fiscal circumstances. That's why this year the province will be providing $515 million to 388 municipalities across this province. Our government has a record of helping municipalities right across in comparison to the record. Excuse me, record. Down, the member for Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox, Addington, you're warned. New question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister, this week we heard yet another deeply disturbing story of a family being torn apart due to the inadequate developmental services available for children in Ontario. Nine-year-old Nico Leduc suffers from a severe case of reactive deta detachment disorder, which causes him to be extremely violent and act out of, out of self-destructively. Due to extremely serious nature of his problems, there is nowhere even close to his greater Sudbury home that can provide the intensive treatment he needs. Nicole's mother, Dr. Nicole DeMay, has been told that her only way her son can get the care he needs is by making him a Crown Ward. Minister, do you believe taking this child away from his mother is an acceptable response to the plight of his family? The Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, and I want to thank the member opposite for the question. And as she knows, I, I can't discuss specifics of cases, but always happy to talk with her uh, generally about what we're doing, both in uh, developmental services for children and child welfare. On the uh, development services front, uh, there have been a number of investments made. Uh, in fact, an additional five mil million this year to reduce wait lists. Five million dollars this year, Speaker, to to reduce wait lists for different services such as physiotherapy, occupational ther therapy, and speech language therapy. And uh, new, these new uh, investments will bring the total for children's rehab services to 104 million. And, uh, Speaker, I, I I know that the member opposite is very interested in the work of our children's aid societies. They do an excellent job each and every sir? day protecting the safety and security of our children, and I welcome uh, for the question the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. First, I would like to remind this minister of a report from the Ombudsman in May of 2005 called a rock, a rock in a Hard Place. Where are families supposed to go? This is absolutely unacceptable. Nico is scheduled to come home tomorrow with absolutely no supports. This family is up against a brick wall now. Their son desperately needs the specialized care, but he also relies 
relies on the loving attention of his mother. If a child with a physical impairment required treatment, we wouldn't dream of making that child a Crown Ward. Why is a child with mental health problems treated differently? Does the minister believe that children who need mental health treatment should be treated the same as children with physical health challenges and have the ongoing support of their family? Minister. So, Speaker, I absolutely believe that children and youth with mental health issues should be treated as timely and in as accessible way as other persons with illnesses and injuries. And that's why, Speaker, I recently announced the creation of 14 children's uh, mental health lead agencies across the province to coordinate that, those programs and services so families and children can go to one place to get the services in the community they need. We know, Speaker, that 70 per cent of mental health issues start in childhood and adolescence. We we know that one in five adults has a mental health issue. Speaker, our investments on our comprehensive mental health. Uh, the member for Hamilton Mountain, and come to order. The agencies I've announced are going to be coordinating that service, helping families navigate. And next and year, sir. I will be announcing more lead agencies for a total of 34 lead Good agencies off. across the province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. The, the member for Hamilton Mountain, you're now warned. New question? Member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister responsible for women's issues. Minister, December 6 is National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. This day was established by Canada's Parliament in 1991 to ensure Canadians would never forget the tragic deaths of 14 young women who were murdered at l'École Polytechnique de Montréal on December 6, 1989. As we mourn the loss of these women today, we are also reminded of all women and girls for whom violence and the threat of violence are daily realities. Minister, the Premier has placed upon your directorate the responsibility for continuing the work of leading our government's efforts to prevent gender-based violence, with the goal of an Ontario where all women live free from threat, fear or, fear or experience of violence. What initiatives has your directive implemented to raise awareness of violence against women, strengthen support for victims and to focus on prevention. Thank you, Minister of Children and Youth Services and Women's Issues. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Davenport for raising this very important issue and raising awareness uh, on this important day. Uh, speaker, as I've talked about before in this House, our government has increased funding for community services that help uh, deal with domestic violence. That increase has been 55 per cent, Speaker, since 2003. And we actually began these investments at a time when the former government was cutting services, such as to women's shelters. So in 2013-14, we're investing $142 million into these very important services. And I was with the Premier this morning, Speaker, to announce a package of initiatives to raise awareness of sexual violence and harassment, to enhance prevention <coughs> initiatives to combat sexual discrimination, harassment and violence, and improve support for victims Answer. of sexual assault and harassment. We remain very much committed, Speaker, to an Ontario free of domestic violence and sexual violence because we believe every woman has the right to feel safe and secure Thank you. wherever they may be. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I think this government has demonstrated that women and their children in crisis are a priority. Recently, there has been a very bright light shone on the importance of supporting women suffering from abuse and harassment. But the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women remind us this is a difficult problem that has been troubling society and its victims for a very long time.
Sometimes there is a lack of awareness or information as to the availability or accessibility of resources out there. In Davenport, several not-for-profit organizations provide shelter and counselling for women who have suffered domestic violence. For example, Abrigo and the South Asian Women's Centre both offer a positive environment where women facing abuse can receive a wide array, a wide array of support. Constituents Question. in my riding of Davenport and advocates have expressed interest in knowing exactly how the government is addressing the needs of women and children at risk. Minister, could you please explain what services and supports are available to women and their children suffering from threats of domestic violence? Minister or abuse? of Children and Youth Services and Women's Issues. To the Minister of Community and Social Services, Speaker. The Minister of Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as recognized by the Minister responsible for women's issues and through the leadership of our Premier. Premier, supporting women who have suffered from sexual and domestic violence is very important to our government. We fund over 200 agencies across the province dedicated to assisting women experiencing violence. In the last year, over 18,000 women and children were served at one of the 96 emergency shelters funded by the government. Over 49,000 women and children visited one of the 177 government-funded counselling agencies that provide crisis crisis support counselling, sexual ass assault counselling and long-term therapeutic counselling. Over 55,000 calls from women in need were answered by one of the provincial crisis helplines that are available 24-7. As we reflect on the unfortunate Answer. examples of domestic and sexual violence and from my conversations with the staff of these hard-working agencies, we understand the impact these support services can have on an individual Thank you. and the need for our work to continue. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of uh, Community Safety and Correctional Services, <clears throat> Minister Fire Chief Cynthia Ross Tustin of the Essa Fire Department from my riding of Simcoe Gray, is Ontario's leading voice in support of rural residential sprinkler campaign. Minister, I believe Chief Tustin has raised this matter with you directly. So, as you know, rural firefighters face several different challenges than their urban colleagues including longer travel times over greater distances and the need to bring their own water supply to put out fires in most cases. Sprinkler systems in rural homes would improve public safety and the ability of rural firefighters to do their jobs. Minister, will your ministry implement Chief Tustin's request to help reduce costs for rural Ontarians who want to install sprinklers in their homes? Thank you. The Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition for asking a very important question. He's absolutely right. I had a, a, a great opportunity to meet with uh, the Chief of ESSA um, um, at, at the, uh, at the, the rural, at the, uh, uh, the, the plowing match, and uh, she, was, she was very generous with her time, uh, gave me a, a, a very good uh, a tour of a model home that demonstrated the different kind of technologies uh, that exist when it comes to uh, residential uh, uh, sprinklers uh, that could help in, of course, in making sure that our homes are safe and, and communities are, are safe uh, um, as well. Uh, and as a result of that uh, conversation, uh, Speaker, we've of course followed up and we're working uh, with the chief and, and looking into the matter and, and having uh, having a very engaged yes, conversation uh, to see what next steps we need to we need to take uh, to ensure that uh, our homes are safe uh, in our communities. Thank you. Supplementary. <clears throat> Again to the uh, Minister. Minister, the Rural Residential Sprinkler Campaign builds on other practical and responsible public safety measures adopted by this House, like smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors. Chief Trustin, Tustin sorry, has discussed with you the idea of establishing a tax credit or other incentives to encourage people living in rural areas to install a fire sprinkler system in their homes on a voluntary basis. Such incentives could be similar to existing tax credits to encourage people to make their homes more energy efficient, for example. So, Minister, on behalf of rural residents and their brave local firefighters, will the government take steps to reduce costs for rural Ontarians who want to install sprinklers? 
Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Speaker. I want to thank the member. He's he's absolutely right. I mean, I, I have to give uh, I have to give uh, uh, credit. Uh, to the chief uh, from ASA for, for really doing her, her due diligence, done a lot of good work in their regards, and they have come up with very constructive solutions as to how we can enable uh, homeowners to, uh, to be able to put uh, 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 sprinklers, fire sprinklers, in, in their home. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, she's done tremendous work. We are very much engaged uh, with her in, in ensuring that uh, we find ways to, uh, to prevent fires, to make sure that our homes are, are safe. We, uh, speaker, are very, uh, very proud of the fact that we have made sprinklers uh, uh, mandatory in, in uh, multi-unit residential uh, uh, buildings uh, and in care facilities as well. And perhaps this is the next step, and I look forward to working with the chief uh, on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Point of order, the member for Timmins, James Bay. During the use of the clock today, I would ask you to extend question period to allow us to do our question that we should have got in. Point of order. Pursue and stand in order 38A. The member for Hamilton Mountain has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Children and Youth Services concerning developmental mental health services for children. This matter will be debated next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Point of order, government house leader. Thank you, Speaker. I just, uh, I just noticed that a, a very dynamic young man from my community of Ottawa Centre is in the house. I want to welcome uh, Fritz Okra to Queen's Park. Great to see you, Fritz. Thank you. Point of order, government, the opposition leader. Well, I'll be government soon. <laughs> Three and a half years, folks. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent that the Orders for second and third reading of Bill 16, an act to proclaim Christmas Tree Day, be called immediately, and that the question on the motions for second and third reading of the bill be put immediately without a debate or amendment. Oh, yes. The member has seek unanimous consent to move a motion on Bill 16. Agreed? Agreed. I hear a no. Point of order, the member for Prince Edward Hastings. Actually, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd just like to welcome a guest who is up in the uh, lobby upstairs, one of the most exciting athletes to ever take the field in the Canadian Football League. Mike Pinball yeah. Clemens yeah. is in the house today. Welcome. James Bay. I only wish he had been playing for the Thai Cats last week. <laughs> <clears throat> Order. We have a deferred vote on a motion for second reading of Bill 35, an act to repeal the Public Works Protection Act, amend the Police Services Act with respect to our courts security and enact a security for electricity generating facilities a nuclear facilities act 2014 call in the members this will be a five minute bell
And I ask members to take their seats. I'd ask all members to take their seats. <laughs> On November 25th, Mr. Nackley moves second reading of Bill 35. All those in favor will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. McMeeka. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerlo. Ms. Domerlo. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vanto. Mr. Vanto. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed will please rise and one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 91, the nays are zero. Whoa. The ayes being 91, the knees, nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. The bill, does he like you to push it away? First, you understand an order of the House dated December the 3rd. The bill is ordered referred to the Standing Committee on General Government. Point of order, the, the member for no. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to invite all members to the front lawn. There are going to be members of the taxi industry uh, from the City of Toronto there today, and I'm sure they'd like to hear from their representatives. Thank you. Thank you. Point of order, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to introduce you to a, a visitor who's just arrived here at the Legislature. It's my daughter. Her name is Claire Matlock, and she's a third-year student at the University of Waterloo. Thank you. This house stands recess until 1 p.m.